So, Charlie, you've said that the explanation for how the universe seemingly violates the second law of thermodynamics is that there is, um, we have to deal with gravity in a different way, that gravity, you have to reverse the side and make everything work differently, and that no one's quite clear how this works, but there seems to be something going on there. But how about the second paradox? Um, let's say that we assume all that, it's worked somehow, and we've got things on Earth, and somewhere you know, four billion years ago we had some little stagnant pool or some clay molecules, whatever it might be, and somehow out of that a something that was capable of reproducing itself was produced by some random chemical reaction and it had babies and they had babies and after four billion years of evolution we end up with a pinnacle of evolution such as ourselves. Um, doesn't that also, I mean there's no gravity really going on here, but does this also violate the increase of entropy? We're going from apparently very disordered stuff, or some sort of stagnant pool, mm -hmm. to highly ordered organisms such as ourselves mm -hmm. and our viewers here. Um, and gravity won't get us out of this one. No, gravity won't, but you're, this is a, a, only an apparent violation. But instead of talking, before we talk about evolution, let's just talk about you sitting here. You had breakfast this morning and I haven't had my lunch and this is what I'll be eating for lunch. And these are essentially carbohydrates and I'm breathing oxygen. And essentially I will extract the chemical energy here. I will burn it inside of me by breathing oxygen and then putting out CO2. So I'm, burnt, I'm a factory that's burning stuff, right? So to stay alive, I have to put in low entropy material into my body and essentially have electrons falling deeper into potential wells and I get that energy out and that's what helps me to talk and, and think and re reply to you. So right now, you, neither you nor I or any life form on this planet is violating the second law. For example, here's a nice piece of thing. It's very well organized. But what these green things are, they're chloroplasts in there. They accept the light from the, the sun. And then they use that energy to organize themselves, just like I'm using this energy to organize myself to produce ATP, so making my hand go up and down and my biological cords go like this. So that I, you, no life form violates the second law like that. But now you, let's talk about evolution. So, well, let me bridge, bridge those two. So your whole life, you are eating, 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 putting out CO2 and peeing and pooping. And if you take all of that together, take Paul Francis over here and all his excrement over here and all the heat that you've produced, add them up, this, the total will be more entropy than would be the case if you did not exist. If that's the case, and I'm, I'm sure it is, then you have not made the world, you, your complexity here, your low entropy ball here, has increased the entropy globally. So the presence of life increases the global entropy of the universe. Now, so let's talk about evolution now. So when we say oh, you, you trace, okay, we start out with something simple and now we're really complicated, but you've probably heard of a Ponzi scheme. And that is, a, a, I think that the complexity that you see around you is what you're doing is looking at the 1% and saying, wow, the 1% is getting richer, but you're forgetting about all the excrement and all the, the uh, people at the base of the pyramid who are giving you that free energy to produce that complexity. In other words, your complexity has a cost, and when you take those costs and compare it to the low entropy complexity of you have, put them together, you will in fact get a total that's larger than it was. And so that I think is the, the simplest way to understand that co the increasing complexity that might or might not be there in evolution, that's still a co controversial subject, but let's just suppose it is, to the extent that it's there, it has come at the price of exporting lots and lots of entropy to the rest of the universe, making it harder for those guys at the bottom of the pyramid, those other slimy balls and pools, to evolve into something uh, more complex. Then for the same reason that when you have a Ponzi scheme, you keep on adding people at the bottom, adding people at the bottom, the person at the top gets, you know, more complex or richer, but if you stop adding people at the bottom, then you do not get more complex. So complexity has a price. It comes at a price of free energy. As long as that free energy is there, you can keep extracting it. And that's what we're doing, digging up oil, putting up solar panels. But that's at the price of extracting free energy from the system and therefore producing more entropy than would be the case if we did not exist. So you could almost think that life forms are doing the second law of thermodynamics work for them. They are nature's way so, to course. increase entropy. Is that a reasonable way Th to think of it? That's, yes, that's called the maximum entropy production principle. You could think of it that way, and, yeah, and I have. As a matter of fact, I, when, in a paper I wrote recently, it said something like, you know, instead of thinking of we eat food, instead of thinking, oh, hey, we eat food, you could say food has created us 
to eat it to undo the chemical gradient that we feed off of. Just like a hurricane, I mean, there's a pressure, temperature, humidity gradient that produces a big structure that goes like this, and that undoes the pressure gradient, undoes the humidity gradient, and it lives off those gradients and, and then makes disappear. And that, I think, is what life is doing. It's undoing as many gradients as it can get its hands on. So this presumably indicates that there must be a supply of low entropy or free energy is. that's there's, driving it. So presumably certainly it's mostly is. the sun in the case of life on Earth. Mm, predominantly, yes. But there are also redox potentials in the Earth. I mean, the Earth is not in equilibrium here, right? We have a dense center that's very hot, and then it's cool, and we have volcanoes coming out. And for example, the hydrothermal vents where life might have gotten started, uh, we have chemical disequilibrium. Whenever you have chemical disequilibrium, you can make a redox reaction, particularly if you can catalyze that, then you can extract more energy. That doesn't necessarily have to come from the sun, but life at the surface is predominantly powered by the free energy that we have coming from the sun. Now, uh, it's an important point, here. free energy. What is free energy? Because there's a difference between energy and free energy. There's 6,000 degree photons coming from the sun, hitting the Earth. The Earth is about 300 Kelvin, so about 20 times cooler. And then the photons that are radiated here, they're 20 times as many. So one solar photon turns into 20 uh, photons coming from the Earth, and that's increasing the entropy of the universe. Okay, thank you.